<clears throat> Hello, everyone. That was a smoother transition to the start of our session than I had my first one. Uh, welcome to our third session of CME News of Fall. Do we really need another session about AI? The answer to that question, of course, is yes. Session sponsored by Haymarket Medical Education and Red Med Ed, our panelists today. I imagine neither of these gentlemen actually needs an introduction to most of you, but Andy Krim and Brian McGowan. Uh, I will turn things over to them to introduce themselves in just a moment. First, of course, big thank you to all of our sponsors, our gold sponsor, Academy for Community Healthcare Learning, Clinical Education Alliance, and Med Learning Group. Our silver sponsors, Academic CME, DKB Med, Hate Market Medical Education, Helio CME, Integrity CE, Medscape, Platform Q Health Education, Red Med Ed, Callum Health, and our bronze sponsors, Answers in CME, Antidote Education Company, Bonham Continuing Education, CME Institute, CMEology, Hippocrates, Excalibur Medical Education, Global Education Group, Infograph Ed, Integritas Communications, Iridium, Continuing Education, MedIQ, and Partners for Advancing Clinical Education, PrimeMed, Peerview Institute for Medical Education, RMEI Medical Education, Vindico Medical Education, and Wright Medicine. Uh, two different ways that you can ask questions. You can use the CME Blue the text line to send in a question, 267-666-0CME. You can also open up the viewing window in YouTube. Um, and click on the little watch on YouTube in the left corner, and then you can enter questions using YouTube chat function. I'll be monitoring both of them, so feel free to use either one. Uh, interacting with poll everywhere, we will uh, be incorporating a question at the very beginning uh, on our ARS, sponsored by CME Outfitters. Big thank you to them. Uh, so remember, you can either use the uh, poll everywhere app, CME Palooza 005, or type in the URL and the web browser, go ahead and do that now on your phone or whatever you may be using. Uh, so we're gonna do the question on the next slide after this one. Uh, speaker disclosure. Any opinions, discussions, and or conclusions expressed are those of our panelists and do not represent an endorsement by or position of their employer, its parent company, or affiliates. Uh, and with that, we are gonna jump into our ARS question for today. How would you describe your overall experience thus far with generative AI in the workplace? Positive, it's been very useful. B, mixed, some positive, some negative. C, negative, not useful at all. Uh, or D, not applicable. I haven't used it at all. Uh, ooh, thus far, no one has said negative. I suppose that's a good thing. Um, Seems like we've got pretty much a even split, more or less, between positive and mixed. That seems right. Or people haven't used it at all. So that is great. So Brian and Andy, you have a general idea of where your audience is coming from. Everyone loves it. No one thinks it's negative. Great way to start. Uh, I will turn things over to you guys. I want to know who those people are in the last bar. Not not uh, having used it at all over the last year. That's uh, that's question. interesting. Um, let me figure out what I'm doing here. Can you, there we are. There it is. So Brian, you want to introduce yourself real quick and then I'll just run from there. Sure, Brian McGowan. I am uh, by day chief learning officer and co-founder of Archimedics. By morning and by night, I am a JSET podcast po uh, host, and I work with and volunteer all over the Alliance in different capacities. Um, and uh, for at least the last 15 years, um, I feel like Andy and I have been like the early tech adopters. In fact, if I go back almost 15 years ago, I was the founding member of the Alliance Emerging Technologies and Education Committee. Um, I did such a good job that it was disbanded like a year or two later, but so I've got a long history of getting my feet wet and stumbling through new technology. Thank you. And I am Andy Cram. I'm the Director of Education and Professional Development by day for the American College of Osteopathic Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Uh, by night, I uh, make catch up and more on that later. So um, 
We're going to start off today with a with just kind of an overview of generative AI, how it differs from differs from traditional AI. Uh, go through some of the major platforms out there by category, and then we're just going to jump into this. This is a um, uh, an interactive session, even though uh, you can't really talk and wave at us, but but please drop your questions in. We'll answer them along the way. Uh, we want a lot of questions because uh, these sessions always generate a lot and, and it means you're paying attention and listening and, and it sparks curiosity. So uh, Andy, before you start, just a reminder, yes. uh, we both strongly advise that you magnify your screen as much as possible on whatever device you're using and screenshot, screenshot the shit out of the presentation. Um, there will be links made available on the archived version on the CME Palooza website. Either of us are more than happy to walk you through the use cases after the fact, but take uh, take the opportunity while we're going through this to just screenshot and save, save um, as much as you can from the presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that, Brian. Um, so, so essentially traditional AI, was a series of ifs and thens. And so if this happens, then this happens. And, and that's the way AI worked uh, up until about 2016 when transformers, uh, generative transformers were developed uh, and then really hit the market uh, at the end of uh, last year. Um, what generative AI does, it attempts to create a new, a newly uh, created data that resembles human created content. And it does this through a series of uh, predictive analysis, uh, learning, and, and uh, methods like that. Um, they're divided up. Uh, large language models are probably the one you're most, most familiar with. Uh, some of the major ones, uh, these are by far not the only ones, but these are the ones that have, that have kind of gained the most traction. OpenAI, um, and Microsoft has invested a lot of money into OpenAI uh, with ChatGPT. Uh, Google Bard, um, Llama's Met, or Meta's Llama model, and Llama 2 um, is gaining traction. And then Anthropic's Claude, and Amazon uh, just last week just invested $4 billion and uh, $10 billion into uh, uh, Claude uh, to enhance its AWS products. Um, there are image generating models. Um, Microsoft, uh, which uses the Dolly for um, uh, from OpenAI uh, through its Being Image Creator. Mid Journey is is one of the most popular ones. It, there's a little learning curve there. Um, I'm going to go around these in a different order. Stable Diffusion is a really solid, good model. Uh, Dolly uh, through OpenAI. Uh, you'll see some examples of that in here. Uh, you'll may also see some examples of Ideogram. It was one of the first models to actually be able to include text uh, into the images. Uh, now some of the others can do that as well. And then remove background. Uh, and there are several models like this too, that you can just throw an image up and it takes the complete, the background out of the image. Um, there are also models that do image enhancement, can take, make an old picture look brand new, very sharp, increase the scale, uh, things like that. Um, video generation, oh, and that dropped off the end, sorry. Uh, models, uh, hey, Jen. Uh, Synthesia and Levin Labs are all great at creating uh, video from text, uh, presentations from text. Um, Topaz Video AI will enhance and scale your video using AI. Uh, and Runway is is true text to video. You can you can say create a uh, uh, a clay model of a kid running down the road. And in 45 seconds, you have a video of a clay model of a kid running down the road. It is, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, all of these have different subscription tiers. So, so be aware of the ones you're signing up for and testing. Almost every one of them has a free version that you can try. Um, and then there are integrated products. Again, this is a result of the uploading in, into the system. Um, all of the Microsoft suite, especially Excel, has uh, Copilot now, which is powered by OpenAI. Uh, Google. Uh, has integrated Bard throughout its entire suite. Uh, Adobe Creative Cloud has has released some amazing, amazing products over the last uh, few months, including the generative fill part of uh, Adobe Photoshop. Um, uh, Adobe Express has some tremendous AI uh, features in there, um, and uh, Illustrator does as well. So if, if you're not a member of that, you may want to take a look at that. Um, Canva. 
uh, has integrated AI into its system where it will create content for you. It, it's, it's really cool. And then Zoom uh, and Teams uh, is part of Microsoft. Both have AI integrated into it now where it can take notes. Uh, it can uh, provide summaries. It can uh, do actions that you tell it to do. Um, I'm still learning that one. I don't know as much about that as I could, but I've read about it and it seems pretty cool. Um, here are just some of the recent advances in AI. Uh, there have been huge updates over the last few weeks in all the major engines. Uh, almost every engine now has enhanced data controls, so you can share what you want and hide what you don't. Uh, that's privacy. Um, live browsing has been integrated into a lot of the models, and, and as well, Google, for example, offers inline fact checking. Uh, so Google Bard will generate something, um, and then at the bottom it says, hey, this doesn't seem right, let's check this. Um, and you can check it using Google. Um, image recognition, analysis, and generation integration within a lot of the AI models. Um, ChatGPT calls this vision, visual or vision. Um, and um, there has been the establishment of working groups for application of AI, uh, ethical application of AI, and responsible use, uh, both on a national and regional levels. Uh, and association levels. So these are all kind of the big things that are that are that are happening in AI right now. Uh, and now Brian is going to talk walk you right into prompt engineering. Thank you, Andy. Derek, you got me up. Perfect. So um, we wanted to give a little bit of a skills background before we go into all the use cases. And I think to be as uh, clear and as explicit as possible. Um, the, the idea would be that we want to introduce this concept called prompt engineering. Um, for almost all the models that Andy describes, really all of them except for the integrated suite of products, the interface between you, the user, and the large language model or, um, is uh, the creation of a prompt. So uh, the classic classic <clears throat> now, I say, 11 months publicly available, ChatGPT, um, is this conversational model where you're telling the Gen AI what you want it to accomplish. Um, some of the coolest quotes you'll hear is like, will our jobs all disappear because of Gen AI? And the general belief by everybody who studies this is that your job is unlikely to disappear. However, those who can use Gen AI to do their jobs better are going to um, outpace everybody else. And so what that's meant to me and basically where I've been focusing my energy for the past 11 months is this idea of building a skill set for myself around creating effective prompts. And that skill set is principally a logic skill set. Like what do you want the AI to do and how clearly can you articulate it? So as a little bit of a use case, if you look at my screen in the upper, uh, at the very top of the screen, you'll see that apparently 24 year old version of Brian, which is still the headshot. Um, and I asked in this case, ChatGPT, what is a prompt in generative AI? So I wanted a background. I wanted something that I could explain to everybody on this CME Palooza session. And what it writes back to me in probably fewer than 10 seconds is that a prompt is the initial input string of text that serves as a cue or model to generate a response. It can be a question, a statement, or even a single word. It gives me a little bit about how does Gen AI, how do prompts work? But I want to just scroll down to the bottom. The roles of prompts and user experience. The quality and specificity of a prompt can significantly influence the utility and relevance of the generated response. So when I talk about prompt engineering, the skills that you want to develop are the ability to be more precise, to be more clear, and to provide greater context. So a really well-crafted prompt will guide the model to produce highly specific and relevant information. A really clear prompt will minimize ambiguities, making the generated output, out, output more accurate. And we'll see each of these things over and over in our use cases that we're going to walk through. And the context of the prompt may um, allow for the model to generate more meaningful responses. And so Gen AI and each of the large language models have basically tested this in a lot of different ways. But there really is no, there's no uh, 
I guess the best way to say it is there, there's there's no user manual, so no, very few, uh, if any, of these large language models tell you exactly how to use them, right? You you really need to experiment. There's best practices on how to use them, but the use cases that you could generate by effectively prompting these are almost limitless. At the end of the day, what ChatGPT tells me is that the prompt serves as the entry point for human interaction. It plays a pivotal role in determining the quality and the relevance of generated text. And therefore, and I can't emphasize this last sentence enough, understanding how to effectively craft prompts can be the key, uh, the key skill in leveraging these models in various applications. So that's what a, a prompt is. What I attempted to do is to go into ChatGPT and create an initial prompt asking it how to create better prompts. And again, this is an example that we'll see over and over again. You can often, if certainly if you're new to this or maybe even intimidated by it, you can actually ask the large language model to provide guidance. You'll see this come up a few different times. So I created this prompt. I'm a novice user of generative AI. You, generative AI, are a supportive expert in generative AI, what are 10 best practices you can recommend I leverage when designing my prompts? And here we are 10 seconds later, um, ChatGPT comes back and says, here's 10 practices you'll find valuable. And so we scroll down and you can see each one of these. But here's the cool experiments and a type of experiment or use case that I really ask everybody to find a chance to do. And that is that I took that same exact prompt for ChatGPT and then I submitted it um, or entered it into Bard and entered it into Claude and entered it into one other perplexity I think I used. Um, and what it came back to me with is um, a pretty robust list. Um, not necessarily easy to see when I zoom all the way in like this. Let's see if I can do it a different way. Let's zoom out and then zoom in this way. Okay. Okay. So uh, on the left is what ChatGPT did for me. Uh, and then you move over to Bard and Claude and Perplexity. And I don't want to get into all of the details, but I want to focus your attention on the color coding. Because what we see here is, and this is a little thematic analysis, a little qualitative analysis of the 10 best practices that I got from each one of these models, is that if it's in red, it's actually a potential contradiction. They're telling us each one of these Gen AI models is actually telling us that something that sort of contradicts what the other model is telling us is a best practice. If they're in green, then they're a consistent recommendation. And if they're in blue, then I categorize them as a unique or one-off recommendation. So um, I know hard to see again, but in uh, the left-hand column for ChatGPT, the one-offs are be mindful of bias. And this isn't a best practice we received from any of the other examples. And then another one is collaborate and seek feedback. And that's basically share your prompts with peers, create a prompt library. A really good best practice, but not one that was shared with other, uh, shared by other um, other models. What I like to do, and Derek has convinced me that they'll be able to share this link, is what I then did is I went through all that, sometimes contradicting, sometimes supportive, um, 10 best practices from each of those models, and I created a tool that we're going to disseminate on behalf of CME Palooza Fall 2023, which is a top 10 best practices in Gen AI prompt engineering. And so we'll briefly scroll through these but defining the role of the response. And here's an example. Tell the Gen AI that you're an expert in adult learning theories, and please summarize the theory of andragogy. Okay. Number two, define the target audience. And here's an example. Write a summary of the current clinical guidelines in triple negative breast cancer for a non-clinical audience. Assume their topic literacy is that of a high school student. Number three, define the tone and the, and the style of the response. Um, and here you may append your prompt with your response should be written in a casual and familiar tone with a slightly humorous style. Number four, describe the format of the response. 
I want you to create a table, the 10 most cited research papers in learning engagement. The table should have six columns and the header should be article title, article name, journal name, year publication, number of citations and summary. And for the summary column, add a brief summary of the publication in 100 words or less. Now, I could have just said, tell me about these 10 cited papers, but by distinctly telling it the format that I want, you're creating uh, an output that may be more consumable. Number five, if you need specific language or specific response, use specific language. So instead of saying, explain the clinical challenges in cancer treatment for a newly diagnosed patient with cancer, you may say, I'm sorry, for specific responses, use specific language. So instead of saying, what's the worst part about a cancer diagnosis, the prompt may say, explain the clinical challenges for, uh, with cancer treatment for a newly diagnosed patient. For number six, use examples. So one I use and Andy uses quite frequently is using the question writing best practices from the National Board of Medical Examiners. Create five assessment questions with feedback from the following lecture transcript. Number seven, if you need creative or brainstorming responses, use open-ended language. So here, instead of saying, explain the clinical challenges with cancer treatment for a newly diagnosed patient with cancer, you would say, what's the worst part of a cancer diagnosis? You're gonna get more general, maybe more ambiguous, but more creative responses. Number eight, we're getting a little bit into like prompt engineering 201, is employee chain prompting. And what that means is you start with a broad prompt, allow the Gen AI to provide you a response, and then ask follow-up questions to gather specific details. And again, we're gonna show a bunch of examples today about how that works. Number nine, the example I just shared with you is use the Gen AI model as the prompt guide. So another example may be before beginning, what other information do you need to optimize your response to the following prompt? And now the Gen AI model is gonna say, okay, let me reflect on that prompt for a split second. Can you answer these three questions for me? Once you answer those three questions in your next chained prompt, the Gen AI will be more efficient or more effective in delivering a meaningful response. And then finally, number 10, be safe. And we saw this across many of the models, but when using any of the large open AI models, be highly cautious about sharing potential um, confidential or legally privileged information. Again, we'll touch on this in our use cases. Our bonus best practice is keep up with latest developments. Andy's already touched on this, but Gen AI is rapidly evolving. What's best practice this week may no longer be best practice next week. So, um, Andy, uh, Derek will have a link to this available in the archive on the CME Palooza website. And I think if I do things right while Andy's digging in, I may be able to throw the link into the YouTube comments thread as well. So Andy, any initial thoughts there? Do you wanna jump into one of yours? Yeah, these are all really, really good uh, uh, tools for prompting and, and best practices. Um, I, th I think, the, the last, uh, the bonus one that you, you dropped here at the end, um, the discussion today is going to be similar, but completely different than the discussion that we had in the spring uh, on this, just because of the evolution of AI. Uh, and it's important to note, and this is one of my favorite sayings too, is the, mo the model of AI, whichever one you use today, is the worst model of AI you're ever going to use because it's going to keep getting better and it has gotten better since the spring and it's, it keeps getting better by the week. And it's, it's uh, uh, in no way going to replace humans and, and most of what we do out there. In fact, human expertise is gonna be needed more than ever uh, to sort through the, uh, some of the chaff that it puts out uh, as well. So um, let's, uh, Derek, if you could go ahead and switch over, we can, um, uh, or Brian, you've got uh, a couple of those. Uh, yeah, I was going to, sorry, I put myself on mute and off mute. Uh, one, I will put a link to this on our agenda page on the CME Palooza website. Uh, maybe I'll put it in a blog post as well. Uh, even though Brian did put a capital P for Palooza, it's basically a lowercase p, Brian. I thought we've gone over this many times before. 
Uh, and also, there was a big thank you from the audience for providing this resource. Uh, this is really great. I think a lot of people were excited to get this sort of a thing. Uh, Andy, do you want me to ask you that question that came in about the yeah? Go ahead. Or do you want to wait? Okay. No, go ahead and so do we did that get one, uh, one question, uh, which was asking about of the list of tools. And Brian, you can of course respond to this as well that you had mentioned previously. Do you have any specific recommendations? Because there's a lot of them you put up there. Uh, which do you use, and why? There, there were a lot, and and this is this is kind of a non-answer. Is you use the best one that that you need to use at the time uh, for the job, um, and you only get to know that through testing them out and working with them. Uh, I use most frequently. I use ChatGPT for the large language models and Bard, uh, but mostly ChatGPT unless I have a huge amount of text. Uh, and uh, and uh, Google, um, not Google, I'm sorry, uh, Claude handles uh, about 15 times more text uh, without hallucinations than chat GPT or BART. It's massive. Um, so you can upload entire books and, and ask questions about that. Um, image models, I use Dolly through, through uh, chat GPT, Microsoft, uh, Bing Image Creator, uh, and I uh, use Adobe Express uh, a lot as well. Uh, because it's integrated into that. Um, for video, I've played around with, I haven't used these for, for major applications, but I've played around with Hey Gen 11 Labs and Synthesia. Uh, Runway's fun to play with as well. Um, and then the integrated products, uh, Adobe Creative Cloud, I use all the time, Microsoft, uh, and to some extent, the Google Suite, uh, but mostly Microsoft and Adobe Creative Cloud. Um, and it's just playing around with these and figuring out which ones can do the best job for you uh, and which one cuts your workload from 100% to about 80%. There's a, there was a Alliance session last week for one of the member sections around this and uh, the conversation eventually got to like, how do you get up to speed with all this stuff? Um, and there was a little surprise, but I don't think I was alone when I said like, 60 to 70 percent of my TikTok feed is just gen mm -hmm. ai best practices yeah and so i've actually you know almost almost every night uh, well we'll see once the phillies start beating up on the rangers in the world series but most nights <laughs> while i'm sitting on the couch i just bring up TikTok, and if i find like top five ai best practices or top five ai new tools i just save that i've got a note-taking app i save it and then I'll review them. And in that moment, when someone in the TikTok universe is explaining this new tool, which I could never wrap my head around all of them at any one time, right. try to create that filter and funnel. In that moment, when someone's creating it, I'm immediately thinking to myself, like, what pain point would that solve? Like, or how is that different than something else? And then the next morning when I'm at my desk, if I've got a free 15 minutes or 20 minutes, I'll open it up and start working through that use case. So almost everything that you that I've done. Now, the bulk of my time, ChatGPT is open in one of my browsers. I pay $20 a month and it is well worth that to do things. But to keep me on the edge of the various models, it's just trying to imagine as these examples are being shared with me, I'm trying to think of the use case that I don't think I could solve now, but I will if I try to utilize that tool. Brian, to that, I'm playing around right now with one of the the new features in ChatGPT is, is their vision feature, where you can upload images or upload uh, other things, and it actually analyzes what's in the image and, and, and can provide you feedback, and you can ask questions on that. Um, you know you know the the paper evaluation forms that, that are common in CME. Uh, I, I'm trying to write the prompts where you, you have scanned in images of those paper evaluation forms and load them uh, into chat GPT and it does the creates the table and does the analysis for you. Um, I'm not there yet, played around with it, had, had medium success, uh, but I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back into it. But but that's a brand new tool that, that came out within the last 30 days that I was trying to find a use case for. Um, it can't tell you how many calories are in a, a picture of a food, by the way. I tried that too. It can't do that. Um, but that's, I, I'm with you. My, my phone is filled with screenshots from TikTok videos. Um, of, of, There's like a weird it, balance, Andy, that like, like if you, if anyone's seen me speak in the last, 
12 plus years, I have explained that basically for 45 minutes to 90 minutes every morning, I used to be professionally on Twitter and I was working with healthcare, social media folks from around the world. And that's how I stayed abreast of educational science and everything. And now with the kind of implosion of Twitter, basically over the last nine to 10 months, that time that I used to spend as part of my professional learning in Twitter has just become TikTok. And so it's actually balanced, not like I'm adding one more big net out there that's trying to capture information, but it's it's proven immensely valuable. Do we want to jump into the needs assessment now and then... Um, Fire away, go with your use cases. Let's do it. And then you jump in when you want. Uh, okay. First of all, I do want to say, um, we, we talk about data security a lot. Uh, a lot of the tools have this now. This is what it looks like in ChatGPT. You can turn off your chat history and training and your data remains your data. It doesn't, um, it, it's not used to train ChatGPT. It's not saved in there beyond 30 days and it's only saved in your history, not anyone else's history. Uh, and no one else can access that. So that's, a, that's an important, especially when you're uploading personal information, especially when you're uploading things that might be considered proprietary, you want to make sure you turn that off. And then you can turn it back on and you don't lose anything you had done prior to that. So um, that, that's an important data control and safety feature that uh, they've added recently uh, that I take full advantage of. Um, so let's start with a basic needs assessment example. And this is going to be largely be using chat GPT. Um, uh, I, I did screenshots of this because sometimes live uh, internet doesn't work the way it's planned. So I just did screenshots on here. This is the paid version, the $20 a month version of chat GPT. Um, there is a um, browse with Bing feature now. Uh, and, and it used to be in there. They took it out and they've added it back in. Uh, one of the questions that just came in, do you have us any suggestion for a resource to create prompts for thematic analysis and qualitative analysis? We're going to get into that in just a little bit. So, uh, Brian, keep that in your noggin. Yep. Um, choose Browse with Bing. Uh, the prompt I put in, you are a public health expert. You're needing to design education to address serious public health challenges in North Philadelphia suburbs. But first, you need to know the prevalence of those challenges. I need you to search the web and provide me the top three public health challenges in this area and the prevalence of each. Oh, and I need citations. So it tells me that it's browsing. It kind of goes through the process here. Uh, and this is what it, it popped out. Uh, the top three public health challenges are over uh, the opioid crisis, uh, overdose crisis, um, traffic related fatalities and the prevalence of uh, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Um, and then I asked it, uh, and then it provided a little background of those and it provided citations that you can see down here. You click those and it takes you straight to the resource. So you can determine yourself it's a, if it's a valid uh, citation. Um, then I asked it what zip codes were considered uh, Northern Philly suburbs. And it, it kind of spit some out. It wasn't a great answer, but it, it kind of spit some out. So, so now you have the kind of the basis of a needs assessment. You can say, okay, let's look into this overdose crisis uh, a little bit more and, and see uh, where some educational needs may lie or prevalence of HB, uh, HBV and HCV. Um, but I also did this in Google Bard and see how Google Bard did. Uh, substance use, it did pretty good on the over, overdose crisis uh, there. Those kind of match up, but it, it threw out obesity and diabetes. Um, but it also said, hey, let's uh, fact, check, fact check these. Um, and it gave me some fact check uh, links to go try as well. Um, really important to note with this, different engines are gonna generate different uh, challenges, different topics, different areas. Um, and you're gonna have to refine your prompts. Uh, say, okay, I'm not interested in things like traffic accidents because that's something that a primary care physician other than saying, uh, where your seatbelt can't do a whole lot for. But uh, talk to me more about uh, health-related uh, issues. Um, refining those prompts is, is key to getting down uh, to the information that you're looking for. Um, I don't see any questions coming up on that, but it's th this is the basis. This is, this is not going to write a needs assessment for you, um, but what it is going to do is, is kind of give you some areas to explore. Um, and I also wanted to point out that, that when you go back to the other, uh, to the initial prompt, this is really not something I would normally use chat GPT for. This came in on one of the, one of the, uh, survey questions that we, um, uh, sent out beforehand. 
Um, Generative AI is, is not great in this area. It's not bad, but it's not great. Uh, you can do a lot better job just Google searching um, this information and probably, com probably come up with more accurate information in about the same amount of time. Um, where ChatGPT and, and Google Bard would come in and would be, I have four articles on public health crises in, um, in Northern Philadelphia. Uh, which one is most prevalent? And what are some areas that can be used to address this? And it would analyze the articles and provide that information for you. It, it's more of a data uh, analysis process than it is. Oh, these are the these are the things that Google could present for you anyway. Um, so so it's important to remember to use the right tool when you when you're going after things. And sometimes the right tool is just a, a simple internet search. Sometimes it's not. Um, Question, some of the challenges I have had with ChatGPT, especially for needs assessment, is that I've found it making up the citation. Anything to do about that? 100% check your citations. You're the expert. It's your responsibility. Check your citations. Um, it, it will make it up. Uh, I witnessed some, some fantastic hallucinations by ChatGPT this weekend. Um, but but check those uh it, bottom line it, it's you and it's your your reputation on the line uh you can't go back to a funder you can't go back to to an accreditor and say oh well chat gpt made that up i'm sorry that got included in there and are the citations getting more accurate uh anecdotally i believe they have been uh just from what i have been able to uh use on my own brian do you have any comments on that have you tested that in any way and you're on mute. My answer is the same, off mute okay. as it was on mute, which is <laughs> I All right. Um, so let's get into um, some learning objectives help. Uh, as a CME provider, we talk to uh, uh, our committees, we talk to faculty, and we get some really stinkers of learning objectives. One of, the, one of my pet peeves is using understand uh, in a learning objective, anybody who's ever worked with me will know that's the case. Um, so I put a prompt in. I said, you're a medical education expert. So I told it what it was. You're well-versed in behavioral verbs for effective learning objectives in the cognitive, effective, and psychomotor domains. Um, so now it knows what knowledge base to draw from. Using that information, rewrite the following objectives. And I said, delimited by two hashtags uh, or pound signs if you have an old phone. Uh, for an activity that will teach and measure learner competence only write four objectives. So I've gotten got a little more specific and do not change what the learner is expected to get from the presentation because these objectives kind of outline that, but they're just written very poorly. And so how did ChatGPT do on this? And this was its response. Um, and it did a pretty good job. Now I've got to take these and I've got to uh, refine these and, and, and fine tune these um, based on what the, the content of the activity is, but it did a pretty good job just, just off the uh, initial prompt that we put in. Um, and, and then it tells you these revisions encapsulate a more active learning engagement and measurement of competence, moving beyond mere understanding to the uh, analysis and demonstration of knowledge. So um, it's a start. It, and, and this took uh, what would have taken me probably 15 minutes, took about 15 seconds for this to do. Uh, and if you save that prompt, uh, and just paste in your learning objectives from that point forward, it goes a lot faster than that. Um, and uh, I think time savings is a is a is a huge um, benefit of using one of these models. Um, uh, the efficiency, the uh, effectiveness of, of employees uh, have been shown to, to increase by about forty percent of those who use this over those who don't. Uh, and I'm, I, for one, want to take full advantage of that. I could use 40% of my day back um, for whatever I would probably make in catch up. Um, then I asked it what educational strategies could be used to meet these objectives. And I copied and pasted this out of there so you could see it all on one screen. Uh, and it provided some pretty good um, learning strategies that, that could be integrated into an activity uh, to meet those learning objectives. Um, interactive case discussions, case-based lectures, simulation training, e-learning modules, role-playing activities, everything we're all familiar with, but it tells about how to use these and, and, and how they relate back to the objectives. And you could refine this with more prompts and more prompts. All right, um, Brian, that's the first set of 
of examples I've got. How about you? But we're only getting what are the Here's a question that came in, but we're only getting what are the needs, public health versus needs of specific targeted learners and causalities. Your thoughts. Yes, I have thoughts on that. Again, you're the expert uh, on that. Um, you need to uh, find this information, be able to relate it back to, to the learners you know. Uh, if you're able to put in um, who your learners are, why, ask it why it relates, and you can do this. You can create as complicated of a prompt as you want. Um, it's going to provide more specific information. Um, you can going to go into what are the, the reasons these needs exist? What are they? Where, where do these gaps lie? And it will attempt to do that. I don't think it has the expertise. I'm, in fact, I'm pretty sure it doesn't have the expertise uh, that a medical educator or a CME education designer would uh, be able to uh, apply uh, to, to that to that craft so yeah I, I I'm still in the school of uh, use cases where you can create a lot of context where your prompt is well organized where you have the context to share with it with, or where the outcome is brainstorming or more general or ambiguous or gray, there's not a black and white answer and it's not an expert black and white answer. Mm -hmm. The reason why I shared in that um, prompt engineering best practice sheet is to tell Gen AI that you're an expert in adult education, now explain andragogy to me, is that one of the uh, most cringe worthy examples that I've seen with all of the large language models because of the data they were trained on is an over-reliance and almost an advocacy for learning styles. Yeah. Right. There are biases in a lot of different, um, through, we can see this through a lot of different lenses. Um, and maybe that says something about me, that the bias that makes me cringe most in my use so far, that I've seen so far in my use of Gen AI, is its propensity to pick up on myths in adult education and learning theory and treat them as if they're uh, realities. And so this belief that, that the end user, certainly when you're in an expert field like medical education or adult learning or something like that, the end user has to be expert enough to view the output of these large language models as um, through a skeptical lens. You always have That's to right. think like a scientist. Everyone always hears me say that. I am interested in that last question, Andy. If you read that question that Derek shared at 1139, is that specifically saying that within needs assessments, we also have, we often have casualties? Because I feel like a lot of the needs assessments <laughs> I read when I was a supporter, I felt like I was a casualty from having to read that needs assessment. So I, my, it feels my pain. The deterioration of my eyesight probably translated that correctly and the causalities, but um, casualties work well too. Uh, <laughs> so. There you go. Good segue, Derek, to move us along. Um, sort of a use case here, but since uh, Andy was showing you behind the scenes and some of the safety features that are available to stop using your, your history and make sure the data is not being used to continue to train the model, is this idea for ChatGPT of custom instructions. This is a paid feature. Um, as I mentioned, I pay $20 a month for it. Um, but what it allows you to do is basically uh, mind meld with the large language model. And so these are instructions that are applied without me having to type them back in all the time. So whatever the prompt is that I'm sharing, the Gen AI model is actually saying, I, I can interpret that prompt in a lot of ways, but what Dr. McGowan wants me to do is he wants to interpret it as a research scientist and chief learning officer who studies how adults and specifically clinicians think, learn, and perform. I appreciate the writing styles of Kahneman and Pink and Alter and Grant and Dweck and Sunstein and Brian and Heath. And I wrote my first book. And so you can actually go back to that book and that feeds the learn the writing styles that ChatGPT will respond with. And then how would you like me to respond? I have ideas around tone and style and examples that are all built into my custom instructions. So that's a, a, something to consider because the first use case I want to share is probably one of the most general use cases that you can find. And I think probably one of the most valuable use cases in terms of solving pain points and 
um, finding productivity efficiencies. And that's just idea of just general writing, right? Whether it's a blog post or marketing materials for your program. Um, so basically because I have those custom instructions, I can get away with a slightly smaller prompt using the following framework, create an article about 950 words. I want you, the prompts to be a cognitive psychology, behavioral science and change management expert. Um, but look at that last sentence before beginning. Do you have any questions or points of clarification? And this is an example of using the AI as a prompt guide and change prompting. So it comes back and it says, can you provide me answers to these questions? Tell me a little bit more about the audience, the clinical context or preferred examples. And then I simply answer them. I don't have to restate the question for one. I want you to think about a super, an audience with superficial awareness of change management and nudges. There's two and three. You might start with creating an outline. So here's an example of a format. Before you start writing the full narrative, give me an outline. And a couple seconds later, there's the outline it creates. Okay. It says, would, are there any adjustments or would you like me to proceed? And you can't say it without being like a Star Trek fan. Like it's like engage proceed. That's all you need to tell it. Just keep going, proceed. And there's the first version of the post. Okay. Pretty good. It gives me a little bit of a, of a kicker down here at the very bottom and says anything about this you like or don't like. And I say, please regenerate the article without the headers or subheaders and expand on the points of practical application. Seconds later, I now have this full prose version with more practical examples. Um, the custom instructions help there because it, it ensures it's in my voice, the chain prompting and using the chat as a guide helps, but these are experiences that each of you should experience for yourself. So if you were to simply write, give me 900 words, um, on, uh, fresh start of that effect, hyperbolic discounting and nudges, the chances of that first output being useful to you are really, really low. But through this kind of more efficient prompt engineering approach in what could take you, as Andy said, four five hours, you can get done in 30 minutes. You still, at the end of the day, have this work product, this final work product here that you export out to Microsoft Word and you polish. It's a first draft. Maybe theoretically it's a third draft the way I was just using prompt engineering, but it's that first draft for you to use. So that's one example. Andy, do, how about um, just given timing? Do you mind if I jump into the data viz example? Yeah, please do, because that's really important. Okay. So um, someone asked earlier if we're all not as brilliant and as artistic as Bobble Shaw Bell, how do we work with data in ways that make um, that can support us as data scientists and data visualizations? And as I scroll down through this, you're going to realize it's never going to be as pretty as what Bobble and Karen do at Infograph Ed. But nonetheless, um, I borrowed this prompt. So this is in a prompt library I found online. And it basically said, I want you to create a data visualization, but here's rules that I want you to follow some do's and don'ts. Look how long this prompt is. You're going to find a lot of these prompt libraries or prompt suggestions popping up online. Um, make use of them. Like we all want to be prompt engineers, but it doesn't mean we need to create the prompts ourselves. We can borrow, share, uh, liberate these prompts. And immediately what the chat GPT came back to me is, is these are the types of things I can do for you. I can create these kind of line uh, plots. I can create these kind of outputs. I followed your rules. So here's my do's and here's my don'ts. And then I say, take a moment to review the attached data set. And the attached data set that I used, column one was a list of dates, about 60 of them. Column B was a list of mindset scores for a learner. So I wanted to demonstrate how a learner's mindset um, fluctuates over time. And column C was a second learner. And I wanna create a visualization or help understand what's going on between these two learners and how their open, closed, growth, fixed mindsets change over time. Um, and so <clears throat> I asked it to do an exploratory analysis, and here's what it does. Within seconds, column one has date, column two has this low mindset value, column three 
as a high mindset value. I can do descriptive or data distribution or time series plot analysis. In my initial review of your data, I found a missing value. Something about your data is not entirely kosher. What do you want me to do with this missing value? Do you want me to remove it or take some other action? This is a data cleaning step. And I simply write remove. Okay, that data has been removed. Let me do your descriptive summary for you. You have 60 events. The mean is 3.96, 5.94. And you can see here's your averages and your standard deviations. There's more analysis I can do, but do you want me to move forward with visualizing the distribution? Yes, please. And it comes up with a distribution of the low mindset with a trend line, a distribution of the high mindset. And it says, here's your trends. And, and now it says, do you want me to create the data visualization for a time uh, series analysis? And I say, yes. And it creates this plot and it gives me some background. And I say, you know what? The y-axis range should be zero to 10. And it makes the y-axis zero to 10. And then it says, that's even better. That's a more accurate perception. And then I say, how about the low mindset value? Give me an average value and add it to the legend. And it does. How about the high mindset value? Add it to the legend and it does. And ultimately I say, give me a better title. Change it to daily fluctuations in learner mindset. And it does. This exercise took probably about seven minutes. I didn't do any data analysis, any statistical analysis. I just kept asking, using the data um, tools within ChatGPT to serve as my data scientist. Obviously, I, I have some training in that, so I kind of knew to ask smarter questions, but I'd be really surprised if everybody on this call couldn't do something like this with their own data. So with that, Derek, I know we have the five minute, just about a five minute warning. Do you want to bring back up Andy or Andy, do you have like one quick, quick example? One quick fun one. Yeah, let's let's jump that in. Um, let me fast forward to this. Uh, this happens a lot. Uh, CV to bio. Um, I use this all the time because we ask for bios for our activities and we get CVs because people don't like to write their own bios. So I use the advanced data feature in uh, advanced data analysis in uh, chat GPT. Make sure to switch those data controls to, to your safe setting. Um, told it you're creating a website for a CME activity. All speakers were asked to submit a bio, but this speaker submitted the CV instead. I need you to read his CV, which I've uploaded and create a one paragraph bio for him to use his website, avoid over flourishing language, keep it professional, be sure to include where he went to medical school, residency and fellowship and any major accomplishments if applicable. 15 seconds later, I have a bio for Dr. Debs. Um, it is a tremendous time saver. Again, I don't have to read his, his CV. I don't have to, to say, okay, what am I going to write here? It does it. Then I can go back and check this information. It's a tremendous time saver for uh, uh, me and the staff at ACOOC. So um, here's a simulation uh, curriculum planning. Just kind of go through this real fast. It created a schedule for uh, OBGENs uh, to go through simulations over three days. Uh, gave me even some logistic tips. Um, one of the red flags was it was only it was going to divide into groups of 50, which I know as an educator, there's way too many people to do a simulation. I told it I wanted it uh, 10 per group instead of 50. It did it again and provided that to me. Um, and then do you want to do an image creation thing real fast, Brian? Sure. I got one up. Um, let's see. All right. So I wanted marketing material for an upcoming program. And I said, I need upcoming uh, webinar for Gen AI in support of continuing medical education. Are there any questions you want me to answer before you begin? And it asked me these questions and I give it what I think are the answers. And it immediately comes up with these examples. And I'm like, that's awesome. But my color palette is blues and these shades. Can you try again? And it comes up with these examples. I, I really like this fourth example, but somehow it doesn't seem blue enough. And I say, I want you to use the fourth example, but use these specific hues. These are our branded hues. And 15 seconds later, I have that. Right? So you, change prompting, allowing the Gen AI to be a guide for us. And I think this is important. Derek, if you can flip over one more time to add to this. Um, I did something similar, but I said, what are the limitations on the use of this image? And this is asking chat GPT. And it said the image gener generated by Dolly are created from scratch and based on prompts provided and are not subject to specific copyrights that say are generated on the fly. However, keep these things in mind. 
uh, purpose representation. It, it also says check your uh, talk to your attorneys. But um, uh, you can largely use these for non-commercial uh, issue or non-commercial projects. You probably can get away with using them for commercial projects since they are not subject to the copyrights uh, because they're created based on uh, static, essentially. So that's all I have. And there is a resource Kevin Lyons mentioned called magai.co. Uh, it's a great interface platform tool that uses chat GPT, Claude, and many AI platforms. Uh, so I haven't checked it out, but I will. Great. Any closing thoughts before I wrap it up? Uh, we'll see you again next week for probably an entirely brand new session on chat GPT. <laughs> and uh, we do have, there will be a survey coming out from the Alliance within the next two weeks that's actually going to support a variety of things that are upcoming um, that are uh, all chat GPT or large language model related. So real quick, we've got an, uh, a pre-conference at the Alliance meeting coming up. We've got a two to three hour spotlight session that's being planned in November for AI. That's going to focus more on administration, operation and business. I just mentioned the survey and that survey is actually feeding a session Tuesday afternoon down at the Alliance meeting on balancing the risk and rewards of AI to improve education. So for those that are interested, this was use case, use case, use case for those maybe a little bit more theoretical or more specific on use cases. Great. Great. Yeah, I think we'll be having a lot more of these over the upcoming year, two years, three years, who knows how long. Uh, so thank you both for a lot of great, practical, useful tips. Uh, I will be, just a reminder, we'll post this up, uh, the Brian's tip sheet uh, on the website. I, there was uh, another thing to post from the first session, so I'll, I'll probably just do a whole blog post and post everything on there as well. Um, but let me go through these final slides. So just another reminder that our CME Flu, the scavenger hunt is ongoing. Go to our sponsor's website, Skin, Bones, Hearts, and Private Parts, uh, and look for the CME Flu as a logo. Click on it and see what happens. Uh, reminder to take our survey, uh, which is also on the live page. There's a link there. We do read your thoughts uh, and information. And then lastly, the next session, which you can click, click, not clink, Click on the link uh, on the live page. Coming up at noon is our lunch session sponsored by Academy for Continued Healthcare Learning, reaffirming our relevance myths and misconceptions about CME and implications for our industry. Uh, we'll get started promptly at noon Eastern time. Otherwise, I think that is it for us. Thank you again to both of you uh, and I'll be back on at 1 p.m. Thanks everyone.